Thanks, Philip. I, I think some of the things I say may be in the borderline area between fact and fiction. Um, many people think that Stanley Matthews was the greatest of all English footballers. And in 1948, he uh, was one of the players in a famous match. It was just after the Second World War and football was getting back to normal. It was a famous match in which England defeated Scotland 2-0 at Hampden Park in Glasgow uh, before 135,000 people. And after uh, England's victory, Matthews was reprimanded by the Football Association. He was reprimanded for his expenses claim. The treasurer of Football Association told him that it was okay for his clay for him to claim his match fee, which was fourteen pounds, and he was also entitled to his return rail fare from Blackpool, which is the club he played for, to Glasgow in order to play at the game. Second class rail fare, of course. Uh, but he was not entitled to claim from the Football Association the sixpence which he had spent on a cup of tea at Carlisle Station while waiting there to change trains. Probably the finest English footballer today is Wayne Rooney, who is reported to be on uh, his contract with Manchester United, pays him £13 million a year. The reason I make this story, I tell you this, which is actually a true story, is in order to illustrate the concept of economic rent, which is absolutely fundamental to understanding the economics of the issues which we're talking about today. Economic rent is the difference between what a resource is paid and what a resource needs to be paid in order to attract it into that activity. And English football was able to obtain very fine players like Matthews for many, many decades by paying them pretty much the average wage of everyone in Britain. Today, the best players like Rooney are paid £13 million a year. Economic rent is the difference between what Matthews was paid and what Rooney is paid. Now, why is someone like Rooney paid so much? Well, there are two parts to the answer. One is the obvious one, that Rooney is very good. But Matthews was also very good. Talents like Rooney's or Matthews are extremely scarce. And scarcity is one of the reasons why people earn economic rents. But the other re the reason why Rooney earns so much more than Matthews does is because there is competition for Rooney's services. And until the early 1960s, the Football League operated, in effect, a cartel which limited all players' wages. And Matthews, throughout his playing career, was victim of that particular cartel. So the economic rent that Matthews created, because actually even more people watched Matthews than watched Rooney, the economic rent that Matthews created went not to, the, um, to Matthews himself, uh, but to uh, the clubs or the league, or it went to the fans who actually didn't pay much for their tickets at that particular time. Uh, the economic rent was in effect redistributed to the consumers of the product. So that um, <coughs> scarcity and competition are the reasons that generate economic rents. Now, <coughs> you, may <coughs> you may find the, the term economic rent a rather peculiar one. And it is a rather peculiar one, and I often think that it's because it's so peculiar that it is so little understood among a wider public than some economists. The concept of economic rent is uh, often traced back to David Ricardo, an economist of the early 19th century, although I found what I think is a rather better exposition of the basic idea in a work by a gentleman farmer from Scotland, James Anderson, 50 years before Ricardo. And as someone who is proud to be Scottish and European, uh, I want to give uh, Anderson some credit in what I have to say today. <coughs> 
The model which they presented was one in which you order the quality of land uh, from the best land in the country uh, at the top uh, at the top left of that slide to the worst land in the country at the bottom right of that, uh, of that slide. And at the bottom right, and the, what that graph shows you is the value of the crop which you can produce from that particular land. So you order it in terms of productive quality of the land from the best to the worst. Now, depending on the cost of growing uh, the crop in concerned, you have what Ricardo called the margin of cultivation. The margin of cultivation is where it is just worthwhile bringing land into production. And that determines the return on marginal land, while all the land is, that is better than that earns more than that, and that is what determines the rent of land. And that was the Anderson-Ricardo theory of what, uh, of what determines economic rent. You can easily see that you can apply precisely the same kind of analysis to uh, a creative activity that you get. You can order people from the most talented, the Roonies of the world, uh, to the least talented, the people like me who would have difficulty in scoring a goal if uh, there was an empty net 10 yards in front of us. All right, we are, all right, or I am, on the bottom right, Rooney is at the top left. And you will see that many people enter the football industry. A few of them are at what one might call the margin of subsistence. They're the people who are just able to earn a living playing football. And of course, there are people who are worse than the people who are able to earn a living playing football, playing football. They play football because they like playing football, or they're playing football because they hope in almost all cases, mistakenly, that one day they might be like Wayne Rooney. So that if we think of that applying to football or to any creative activity, we can see we have a spectrum of people from the talented to the untalented. Now, you'll see some implications that follow from that rather simple, extremely simple model. One is that there will be many people in an industry a creative industry, who are very poorly paid. These are the people who are at the margin of subsistence. There will also be people who are very well paid. They are the Wayne Rooneys at the, at the top left of this. Second, you will see, is that the slope of that line determines both the size of the industry and uh, the total returns to the industry. So the total returns will be, if that line is very steep, people in the industry will earn a lot. If that line is rather flat, they won't earn a lot. And what determines the flatness or uh, steepness of the line is how much better, how much more commercially valuable you are if you are better at doing it. And that varies from activity to, to activity. Uh, but in many of the creative activities which we're talking about, the people who are at the top left are very, very good. That is, 100 people who are only averagely good would not compensate for one person who was very, very good. Whereas in most economic activities, you can actually substitute quantity for quality in some sort of way. So that is why the core economics of any creative activity imply that there are a lot of people in the industry who will be earning not very much and some people who will be earning a great deal. What Martin called in his introduction this morning the winner-takes-all phenomenon is the phenomenon that says Rooney gets paid a lot and uh, most people who play football don't actually get paid very much at all. Uh, the third thing you should notice about this particular piece of analysis is that what is worth reproducing is actually the bit at the top, not the bit at the bottom. So that where copyright protection actually matters is at the top, but you will see also the implication of that, that the economic value of that protection is not really very great in terms of the amount of activity which it's generating, because actually we know that Rooney would be playing football even if he was earning an astonishing amount, 
uh, whether he was earning an astonishing amount or whether, whether he was earning something fairly modest. And you'll also notice a difference between uh, a difference between the agricultural analogy and the creative industry analogy, which is we can all pretty much agree on what constitutes uh, good and bad. But of course, in applying that analysis to, to the creative context, what I mean by good is commercially valuable. The person, if one takes the book publishing industry, the person who is at the top left of that particular diagram is not Jane Austen, it's uh, John Grisham. Uh, now, we might spend some time discussing why it is that John Grisham is more commercially successful than Jane Austen. It's actually quite an interesting question, but let's take it simply at the moment for an empirical fact. That's a big difference here, that whereas in most contexts economic rent is determined by quality, which is objectively measured, in this, in this area it's measured by, uh, uh, by commercial application. So that's one part of what goes to the creation of economic rent, scarcity. Uh, and the, the reason it was initially applied to land is because of the obvious fact that the amount of land that exists is necessarily limited in overall supply. The second reason, and the reason Matthews was paid so much less than Rooney, is that competition for Matthews services was suppressed. Competition for Rooney's services is, is very active. Uh, and that create, the, that's, uh, takes us to an analysis of where the rents that are created in a particular activity, whether it's agriculture or creative activity, where these rents are distributed. They're going to be bargained over, and the reason Rooney is paid so much more than Matthews is that the cartel of clubs keeping down footballers' wages broke down in the 1960s with the result that the rents migrated to the players. Now, in any economic value chain, we have these kind of battles over rents. Uh, and I want to illustrate that for the structure that actually, to my mind, replicates the majority of creative industries. I've called it the tripartite structure because there are basically three elements to the value chain of uh, these kinds of industries. There is the originating talent, there is the distribution of the product, and in between there is an activity which we might call publishing. It's not called publishing in all creative industries, but it is the recognizable form of being the intermediation uh, activity. So there is the talent which produces the creative material, there is the publisher who is the intermediary, and there is the distribution chain that actually gets it to consumers. And I can place more or less every industry of this kind into this kind of framework that I call a, a tripartite structure. Now we've learned that economic rent is generated by scarcity. And the answer is, uh, and that means that who gets the rents in these chains actually depends on where the scarcity actually lies. Now there is an intrinsic scarcity which is greater in the originating talent segment than in any other. There is an intrinsic scarcity which comes from the, the phenomenon I've described which is some people are very good at it and you can't substitute people who are not quite as good uh, easily or at all for the people who really are very good. That isn't true to the same degree in the other ones. You can substitute quality for quant quantity for quality to a, a much greater degree. But the distribution of rents across that chain depends on where the scarcity is. If we go back a thousand years, the scarcity was in distribution. And the result of that was that all creative industries were effectively controlled by the Catholic Church, which in Western Europe monopolized the distribution channels. When printing was invented, uh, that meant actually that the Catholic Church integrated back the people who produced, uh, 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 produ produced creative material were either employed by the church or actually or were either hired by the church or directly employed by the church. And very often they didn't even get their names to credit credited on what it was they produced. 
But as far as printed material was concerned, the invention of, or verbal material was concerned, the invention of printing broke down that particular monopoly. Uh, it meant that rent started to create, move back towards identifiable producers of printed work. And that uh, breakdown also produced the breakdown of the monopoly in other areas. If we jump right to the 20th century from that, you can see that when there was a monopoly of terrestrial broadcasting, uh, the result was that the terrestrial broadcasters controlled not just the distribution, but the whole of the value chain. They were able to determine what was produced and what the people who produced it were paid. And what we've seen over the last 20 years has been the breakdown of that particular monopoly. Uh, the first stages of breakdown of that particular monopoly enabled people to derive extraordinary rents. Roy Thompson famously called his license to run an ITV station a license to print money, which, which for a decade that it, it actually was. But more entry into that segment essentially eliminated the economic rents that went to broadcasters. So in every one of these structures, where the rents accrue, where the rents originate, depends on where the scarcity arises. And with that structure in our minds, I think it's time to ask the question, how does the growth or the rise of the digital economy actually affect these kind of structures? Because the revolution we've had in the last couple of decades changes the world of this in two principal kinds of ways. One is that the cost of dissemination, the third distribution part of the, the chain, has actually fallen dramatically. Now, the, many of the important implications of that actually arise from the knock-on effects that has had on the, on the second of these elements, uh, the publishing intermediation activity. Because if we ask what the publishing and intermediation activity normally consists of, there are three or four components to that. There is the business of selection. That is, the publisher traditionally determined what got produced and what got distributed. And that gatekeeping role and the scarcity of the gates through which the, the gatekeeper would admit you created many of the rents at that publishing stage. So there was the, the selection role. Next, there was the marketing role. That it was, it was the publisher who did the marketing and the publisher who, by that means, enabled the originating talent to meet uh, the consumer. And finally, the publisher typically provided finance for the chain. Sometimes the, the publisher would finance upfront the total of the creative activity. That was typically true in films, for example. Sometimes the publisher would come in at a later stage, paying in advance for a book or something like that. Uh, but the publisher would make an upfront payment of some kind, even if it was only meeting the fixed costs of publication, which were large in these days, even if it was only meeting the fixed costs of publication, uh, the publisher would provide the finance. Now you can see, when we look at it in that way, that it's not just the cost of dissemination that has fallen, it's actually the role of all of these things, the process of selection, the process of marketing, and the process of finance. So that the process of selection has now, to a very significant and probably continually increasing degree, been taken over by the process of peer review, which the internet and digitization has made possible. The rise of social media has also had fairly significant effects on the marketing side of this as well. And finally, the fall in the costs of dissemination have, for some industries but not all, reduced the role of a financing activity of the publishing at the, uh, right at the center of the chain. So what we can see in terms of this kind of framework is that many of the traditional publishing roles are now uh, very largely redundant. That is, many of the publishers are people who have business models which are no longer very relevant to the modern world. So what has happened over the last decade, two decades has been really two phenomena in terms of industrial economics. One is a rather surprising emergence 
of dominant firms in the final stage, the distribution chain, what people often call FANG, the uh, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google uh, network of, uh, of dominant firms in this distribution part of the process. Some of these dominant firms are the product of network externalities. Facebook is large and successful because Facebook is large and successful, and that goes on being a, a cumulative advantage for Facebook. It's very difficult to present the same argument as convincingly for any of the other three in the fang, for Amazon, Netflix, or Google. And actually, the experience in general of these monopolies in new industries at the final stage is that they are quite transitory. Have other firms emerge that take over part or all of these particular roles. So one phenomenon we've seen in terms of the uh, accretion of rents in this digital economy has been the accretion of rents on the part of these dominant firms in the distribution chain. The second part of what we've seen has been the growth of lobbying essentially to support existing established business models. And that has become a very large part of the totality of, uh, uh, of um, uh, business activity in this creative sector. And since the business models that are essentially being rendered redundant are very largely publishing models, it is the publishers who are the most active and in most cases effective in these lobbies. So we've seen that lobby in, in sound recording. We've seen it in the demands for various ancillary rights for, for newspapers. Uh, and we've seen it in um, uh, cases of copyright and territoriality within the European Union or ex-European Union. People don't have the right to have their existing business models sustained by public policy. There is no sense that a, uh, public policy had to sustain the horse and cart industry when automobiles were invented. Business models come and go. And if a business model has come, uh, has come and survived for a century or two, that doesn't mean that it doesn't go when a new technology emerges. Indeed, not only uh, can it go, but it must go if a market economy is to evolve in the ways in which we, we want it. You may be more sympathetic uh, when it comes to the case of individuals who are involved in these kind of activities, so that Martin raised this morning the issue of photographers and journalists who find their, their suffering. It's pretty obvious why photographers and journalists are, are suffering. If, every, if ever, all of us have a camera in our pockets that will take high quality photographs, the number of occasions on which we will require the services of a professional photographer is correspondingly smaller. And for very similar reasons, partly the, the decline of the publishing function of newspapers, together with the availability of many other new forms of news gathering, uh, being able to provide quickly uh, news to a large audience. Similarly, journalism comes under pressure. All of these are essentially aspects of people whose business models have been made less profitable because they're either uh, the activities they provide are no longer scarce or because the activities they provide are no longer necessary with the technologies which we describe. All of these are people whose business models are being rendered less relevant and who are putting political pressures of various kinds on to sustain these business models in, in, in the face of technological change. Now, this is a phenomenon which is not just confined to digital and creative industries. It's a phenomenon which has been part of the growth of the corporate economy over the last two or three decades. We've seen this rent-seeking activity, the attempt to use politics either to sustain uh, outdated business models or to enhance the profitability of established business models. This attempt we've seen in financial services, we've seen it in healthcare, we see it in defense and military spending and so on. All the areas in which 
public activities can be used to promote private interests in the large corporate activities. And the returns to this rent-seeking activity on the part of corporations, there have been various attempts to measure them and they're characteristically very high. And more than that, the corporate lobbyist is generally uh, well-funded and numerous and found very widely in Brussels and in Washington, while the public interest lobbyist is generally noticeable only by its absence. More broadly, unless we control this kind of rent-seeking, I think we risk a degree of sclerosis in our market economy, and probably in no sector more than this do we suffer the potential of that particular problem. I'd finally, in conclusion, note the point that uh, uh, Martin made in his introduction this morning, or one of the other points, which is that in these arguments, in this rent-seeking activity, there has been a sustained attempt to suggest that the interests of creators and publishers essentially are aligned, that the position of publisher needs to be protected because if it's not protected, the creators will suffer. I think if you look at these issues in the broad framework I've described, you will see that actually just the opposite is true. The reduction in the costs of intermediation and the reduction in the needs of intermediation actually strengthens the position of creators in the long run rather than diminishing it and ensure, is capable of ensuring that what is the natural tendency uh, of these value chains for rents to accrue to the point where there is real intrinsic scarcity rather than artificially created scarcity is something that will take the rents back to the creators of the activity. It's now possible to imagine, and one can see instances of it happening, creators having much more direct relationships with their customers uh, than they have been used to in the last several hundred years. As I say, we can see this happening. I am on the board of an investment company, which, among other things it does, uh, awards an annual book prize. And when another of the directors of this company presented uh, the book prize at a, a recent event, he was uh, afterwards taken aside and given an earful by the winner of the prize, who was upset by the fact that one of the largest holdings in this particular company is Amazon.com, a large early investor in Amazon. And uh, the director concerned gave what I thought was a rather bad answer, which was to say, well, you may not like Amazon, but it's Amazon which have paid for your prize, and you ought to shut up. Uh, the good answer, I think, would have been, if you thought about it a bit more carefully, you would understand that Amazon is not your enemy, but your friend. And that's a moment, a note, on which I'd like to end. Thank you. Uh, so um, you told us there were, there were two things that had happened. One was that there was more distributor power or, or retailer power, and that certainly had changed the game somewhat. And you also said there's more lobbying, and there the discussion really was, in a sense, is there a, a tension between the content creator and the publisher? Now, I think I would put it a little bit differently because when it comes to the rent extraction, uh, there may be an unholy alliance between some of the stars and the publishers. Partly because, and I guess the film that is out today about Nixon and Elvis is an illustration of this, politicians like to be among stars. And so if you can bring a couple of those with you to the discussions, to your lobbying, you may have more access. Uh, and in a sense, I think the biggest issue there is whether or not there is a, um, how much the, the big stars and the maybe up and coming people uh, are in conflict with each other. And again, I guess I want to congratulate yet again Lester for their fine performance uh, this year, which showed you don't necessarily have to spend an awful lot of money uh, to win stuff. Um, I'm sure that won't have any implications for any years. It's just a blip, but even so. Um, the other thing uh, I would say with that is that um, staying with football, we, we, sometimes we have this threat about a breakaway league when... Uh, 
when the rent to one group isn't big enough? Well, in a lot of these industries, we do have uh, both threats and actual existence of breakaway leagues in the sense that self-publishing, self-creation has become a reality and a reality where people are increasingly successful. And that's not just true in publishing, though publishing may be one of the better examples of this. Uh, and so um, there is other ways in which there is an other, other event that is happening which, uh, in a sense, undermines the publishers. Uh, so they are squeezed and therefore they are squealing higher as well. Uh, and, uh, and it also may help the publishers to uh, hook up with a couple of star performers in order to do the lobbying. So I think it's, in a sense, it strengthens your argument, which I, I entirely agree with. Um, one of the consequences of these breakaway leagues is that uh, there is potentially more rent to be extracted by the creative agents or the content creators, uh, but then that has created its own problem, and that is one of the reasons why when you talked about distribution, you were not, not just talking about Amazon, which one might think, but also about Google and Facebook, et cetera, which is uh, what uh, many call the, the long tail, in that there is an awful lot of output. We're not short of output. We're not in a situation, I mean, if we started today and thought, hey ho, do, you know, do we have a problem to which the remedy is strong copyright? Uh, it's not obvious that we've got, yeah, yeah, absolutely, because we're, uh, we really have no books and no films and there's no music and nothing is happening and it's a terrible, cold world. It may be, of course, after yesterday, but that's a different thing. Um, but there is, there is that going on as well. Um, I also wanted to uh, just say a little bit maybe about the, and partly about the self partnership and, and the sclerosis that you, you, were, you were talking about. I fear that you're right, that the lobbying, that the powers that lobby will be able to hold back the tide of, of progress. Uh, but one wonders slightly if at least in some of the industries the train has actually left the station by now. That there are now, so author earnings most recent report, and I, I'm not sure how seriously one should take their numbers. But if you look at authors who have published since digitalization, so since, since Kindle, let's say, uh, of the 800 or so who earned uh, more than $100,000 from their Amazon.com sales of not just ebooks but also audiobooks and published books, more than half were self-published. Less than a quarter was Big Five, which you might think of as the main lobbyists. And that's interesting because that may mean that we are, in a sense, beyond the point where there is an awful lot they can do, at least in, in, in the US and UK context. Um, so those were, were some of the, uh, the other sort of thing that, that I was just wondering about is really um, whether or not, the way that we see shifting slowly into streaming as the way of delivering digital content. And I think we may be seeing this in books because why have an ebook which you don't really own anyway when you could just subscribe to one of those other services? But then you think about these services and you wonder about whether, to what extent they're a natural monopoly, these streaming services. Uh, because they, all you need, if you have the biggest content, you are the most attractive provider in a sense. Uh, and so there is that kind of worry that we have substituted uh, one boss, you know, uh, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Uh, we've just moved ourselves from the publishers to, uh, to the streamers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. And, well, uh, how to comment to what I think was an excellent keynote. Um, I basically agree with almost everything you, you said. So I'd only have one uh, comment perhaps and then a number of further thoughts that might fit into this, uh, this, this uh, stream of, of thinking. Uh, the one comment would be that I think a difference between uh, 
uh, the Ricardian rents, land use uh, analogy, and, and especially creative industries, is what is common known, commonly known as the nobody knows principle. And I think that, that that's, that's a difference which is worth mentioning, that um, even when a product, a creative product is finished, uh, there's very little knowledge, even by market experts, if it will be a commercial success or not. And I think that's quite different from land and also different from soccer. Um, so that means that that does something with the with the triangles and and the demand curves that that an economist would would want to draw. Uh, it will need that you it, it will mean that you'll need to well uh, in my own terms uh, let a thousand uh, flowers bloom and see what what comes of it. Um, then on to some some further thoughts. Um, if we go back to um, uh, John Coase, who asked himself in, in, himself in, in 1937, uh, why do firms exist? His answer, of course, was, as you will know, um, because of transaction costs. And if you if we reverse that statement, of course, if you fiddle with transaction costs, if you change transaction costs, the nature of firms will change. The industry of structures will change. And I think the concept of, of transaction costs is also a very powerful concept to, to analyze what's going on in the publishing industries. Um, I think it's a twin sister maybe of, of the scarcity you, you, you uh, focus your analysis on. Um, and to a large extent, the change in transaction cost is an autonomous process. So it's not uh, steered by the industries, it's, it came upon them, uh, but it has had, it has had um, massive uh, effects on on the structure of the market. Um, for one thing, the required investment for reaching the market uh, dramatically dropped in, in, in many, many parts of the creative industries. The self-publishing of books, of course, is an obvious example. Um, for music, uh, well, basically for, for, for a few hundred euros, you have your own studio at home to make music, and with an internet connection, you also have the, the ways to uh, disseminate your music. So. Um, the obvious outcome of that is a, is a tremendous fragmentation of, of any market for creative products. And I think the key question now to look forward is, given the change in scarcity in your analysis, given the, the, the radical change in transaction cost, what kind of copyright do we need for that new situation? And, well, it's a question easily raised and not easily answered. Um, but I think for, for, for answering that question, one needs to go back to the foundations of copyright. Um, and if you ask that uh, to an economist, why do we have copyright? The answer would be roughly like, well, because without copyright, there might be insufficient incentives to create. Uh, because that there are, are uh, uh, public good market failures, externalities uh, associated with creative, pro uh, uh, creative production. Um, anyone can copy works uh, without making the investment in creating the work, and that's something we need to fix. Um, so I think to assess what kind of copyright we need, given the changes in scarcity, given the changes in transaction costs, we need to look back at the question how to resolve the market failure without messing the whole thing up. And um, well, we're currently doing a large project at our at the university, which Martin Kretschmer is also in participating in. And um, what I try to figure out there is the difference between uh, what I've coined jealousy taxes on uh, any other industry which is making money, which products in which somehow I've been involved, and therefore I want a share of that, uh, without any economic foundations in terms of market failure. And an easy example for that would be uh, resale, digital resale even, of uh, copyrighted product. As long as you don't start copying them and distributing again, there is no clear-cut argument why there would be market failure in that, and that means that any entitlement to rents there would just be a jealousy tax. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that. And Thank you very much. Um, uh, John, would you like to respond to your critics? There are, lo there are, there are loads of things there, are, uh, me all, all of them fascinating. Let's start with the last one, which is probably in some sense is the biggest one, this issue. What does this imply about the copyright structure uh, which we need? Now, in truth, that's another half hour 
going to be needed to even start to address that question. But I think you've absolutely got to define correctly the right approach, which is we, could, we should say, what is the economic problem? Is there a market failure of some kind? And the obvious potential market failure would be that there just isn't enough creative stuff around. Well, in all, all, virtually all the industries we're talking about, it really doesn't look like that. Um, and if that is our starting point, then one has to go on to say, what is the problem that requires this volume of legislation? And the answer to that is really not obvious. And that's a very different approach from what seems to me to be the dominant approach, which is a sort of strict constitutionality. It's a kind of approach that in its most ludicrous manifestation determines in the Supreme Court US constitutional issues by asking if the internet had been around in 1788, what would Jefferson and Madison have thought about it? And the ludicrous of that question is, I think, self-evident. So it is not, but equally, the business of saying, how do we interpret concepts of copyright that were, were constructed for really quite different historic business models? How do we try and give some meaning to these concepts in an entirely different world? It seems to me not the way to approach the problem. And I have a prejudice, but I think the economic approach is actually the right way to go about that. I think one other thing that's missing, though, in the structure uh, is um, the role of the various parties, um, not just in demand satisfaction, but in demand creation. Right? So it seems to me that you know, when we think about the, the, the um, demand for the products of land, this is stable and exogenously given. Right? People just want as much corn as they want. Uh, and the land that produces the best corn at the best price is the best land. Uh, it seems to me that in the contemporary creative industry that we have, people are not necessarily even sure what they want. Uh, and a lot of the value that gets created is telling us that you know, it's really Taylor Swift, not Katy Perry, that we should consume. Right? Uh, and so I wonder the way in which you see demand creation influencing the nature of the slope of that line and the roles of the different parties uh, in your tripartite structure in, in influencing demand creation? Is this the sort of thing that the, the last players can do, right? Because you know, the, the last end of the end of the pipeline, Amazon gets to only show us the things it wants us to buy. Uh, is this the role of the publishers to select among the field of creative talent, the ones that they would like us to consume? How does this fit in? I think I'd respond to that by saying that actually it's really agriculture that's the exception. You know, people pretty much know how much bread they want to, to eat. Uh, in most other industries, they don't. And uh, entrepreneurship and innovation is, a, is about really a trial and error process of determining the kind of products that people are going to want. Uh, I mean, Henry Ford famously said, if I'd asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse, which goes back to my, as it were, horse case. And equally, uh, even Steve Jobs, who's widely regarded as great vision, the great visionary of these industries, when he went back to Apple in 1997 and was asked, so what's your strategy uh, for the future? And he said, I'm going to wait for the next big thing. And actually, the next big thing, which is absolutely at the center of our discussion here, was music. Because uh, music was the industry in which digitalization became most rapidly applicable, and in which the music publishers really screwed up in a big way by trying to prevent, uh, as it were, digital distribution being available at all. And it was that failure that created the, uh, the the route for jobs and the iPhone and the iPod and uh, everything that followed from that. Uh, so that I think the business of, I don't really regard it as much of inventing the next best thing as the jobs tactic of saying, uh, be alive to opportunities and determine and take advantage of what the next big thing turns out to be when it comes along. 
because <laughs> most of you are not going to know, even if you're steam trolls. Other, other points? Martin. I wondered in the, the tripartite structure, so if, if the changing role of the, the user, of, um, of the consumer, whether that makes a difference to the, the, the analysis. So a lot of our projects investigated, for example, you know, fan fiction or modifications to games, you know, which turn a game into a different game, it's improved by the, by the user, or the, the, the YouTube type of, of, of transformative creation. Um, so where essentially the user doesn't consume, you know, they do something with, with whatever is being offered to them. Um, does it change the way we need to analyze this kind of industry? Uh, I think that's a very interesting perspective and says perhaps uh, in, instead of having, as it were, the linear structure which I was describing, we almost have a circle in which consumers feed back to creators and this goes round and round in a process. And that, of course, is a huge change uh, from the traditional model of these industries which we, we've been used to. It's a very <coughs> provocative and interesting thought. Yes, well, I think probably the last point we'll take from the floor. If you could make it to the point, please. Uh, thank you very much. It was very, very interesting. Um, I wonder if in that case of prospective change of copyright that, we are, that you are asking for, it would be better to give more rights or give back the rights to the creators, not to the authors in the broader concept of the right holder, but to the creators as persons who actually are the first part in the change in the, in the chain reaction that create more and more and more products uh, constantly in the cultural industries. So that will be the, the basic question. Yeah, I think that goes back to the question of, uh, in my view, absence of alignment between the interests of publishers and the interests of creators. And publishers have succeeded in creating that appearance of alignment in part by a historic role of genuinely being the protector of the intellectual property of the creator. But now in very large part they're not. They're simply attempting to batten on the creator to create, to retain some of the uh, creator's rents, even after their own, as their own rents are being dissipated by the technological changes which are describing. Which takes me back to, to two key questions. One is the Elvis and Nixon kind of observation. I'm sure I can't be the only person who's uh, written about these kind of subjects and been subject to letters criticizing me, ostensibly written by Sir Simon Rattle and the long list of uh, uh, creative people, and where my suspicion, when I look at where the facts is that contain these information actually come from, is that Sir Simon Rattle knows rather little about the content of the letter which is being, uh, which is being submitted. I think a lot of that, that is exactly the process that was being described of using the, the star-struck nature of the, uh, of, of, of the politician to disguise where the real source of the pressure is coming from. So I think um, in that sense, yes, this is all about giving power back to the creators. I think that's going to happen economically anyway, whether it happens legally or not. And that comes back to the point as, has the train le left the station? Well, I think we can be pretty certain that it may take a long time, but people are not going to stop these trains. I've already described how in, in quite a short time, music publishers lost their, their dominance of that industry and in large part of their, their role. And that's one of the worst examples of them now using lobbying to, as it were, milk the historic legacy. Um, in terms of printed or historic, the, the printed or the historically printed word, publishers are being much more effective in, as it were, getting in the way 
but in the long run, they're going to have to find a real economic role or get out of the way. And one can reproduce that story, I think, uh, uh, across the board. You, you can resist technology through political processes for a time, but uh, not, I think, indefinitely. Well, we're going to wrap this session up, but I think just, just perhaps as, um, as a compliment to what's been said, because this has been very much been focused on economics and law, uh, but also actually the political dimension has come into it. I think you know, one, of, one of the terms that really hasn't been used is the role of the state, uh, the allusion to public policy. Um, the creative industries, or the creative economy, is an object of state policy. There's, there, there has, special institutions are created. There's a different kind of intermediary, which is the cultural intermediary, if you like, which is there to provide subsidy, finance, training, because um, there seem to be a failure within the globally competitive system. So um, in addition, and, and then you have um, subsidies through, through the tax system. Um, for example, for film production, uh, television production, animation, games, and there's been a proliferation of those forms of intervention. So I think in addition, you know, those would be additional ways of sustaining rent-seeking, rent would they not, I would imagine. Um, well, yeah. I say this as a non-expert, but you know, it seems to me that that, that so it, it's really, I mean, I think the argument you know, is, is, is clearly not simply about the economy or about technological development, but there are, there, it, it's the way that intersects, if you like, with a wider <coughs> politics, and that politics is also, in the case, for example, of the European Union, or in the case of the British state, connected to ideas about um, the importance of culture and the importance of national identity. So the, the chain goes beyond, and I, I don't want to say anything more about that um, at the moment. What I would like to do, actually, is thank uh, John, Morton, and Joost for uh, their very fine and focused contributions and uh, for adding uh, a great deal, really, to, to the day as it comes to an end. Thank you very much. Applause. <laughs>